Hello, welcome to Jewel Says. I'm Julie. If you have anything you'd like to share or ask me, by all means email me at jewelsays at gmail.com. And I'm going to talk about work, so you know what? If that bores you, you can just tune out now. The reason I'm talking about work is because I'm back in the grind. Don't get me wrong, this is a great contract, but when I'm working, pretty much all I can think about is work. The contract is going well overall. However, I feel anxiety every Sunday night before the week starts and every morning before my day starts. I'm just lucky that I can switch off and not work all weekend. But still, I dream about work, I think about work, I think about the problems. It's irrational, and I realize I felt this all along. But I think I just got used to it because I I always did it. This two-year hiatus I took from the grind made me notice it, I think, because it's back with a vengeance. And this is a good contract, really. What am I supposed to do? I'm sure many of you feel that anxiety. You can probably relate, but we have to earn a living. And even if you love your job, there are things about every job that can be stressful or challenging or parts of a job you don't like. No job is 100% perfect. And I'll admit, I probably feel a lot less anxiety than some people do. I have insecurities about a lot of things. But my work competence isn't one of them. I feel badly for people who struggle. I don't know how they come into work every day and face the music. Because I mean, if I feel this way, working for a good company with great people, all very nice, all very patient, imagine working for some companies. One of the other reasons I've been thinking about work is because I've been hearing all these little news reports, and that includes stories about companies with a toxic work culture. Some might say even a narcissistic work culture. Lately, I've been listening to a podcast that oh, it really resonates with me. It's called Navigating Narcissism with Dr. Romani. I highly recommend you try it if you have never heard of it or listened to it. Some of the things she says, I'm paraphrasing, so I'm bound to get it wrong. Just listen to her if you're interested. But apparently narcissism isn't necessarily a psychological disorder, as in something that could be diagnosed and resolved. She describes it as a personality style that's on a spectrum. Some people have um, a shy personality style. Some people have a very empathic personality style. Narcissism is a personality style, not necessarily a disorder. I mean, that's kind of good to know because sometimes we feel like, well, we can solve it or he can change or she can change, but that isn't necessarily the case. And it's on a spectrum, of course, as many things are. The world is rarely black and white unless you're into math, and that's one of the reasons I like math. But it's on a spectrum with some common traits, such as grandiosity, lack of empathy, uh, very skilled manipulation. And although a lot of the stories in the podcast are about navigating the aftermath of a narcissistic partner, I suppose that makes sense, because the love relationships tend to be the most powerful ones. But some of these episodes talk about managing narcissistic parents or recovering from growing up with narcissistic parents, family members, friends, cults, and even workplaces. Yep, workplaces. Last week, I listened to an episode about WeWork. If you haven't heard of it, it was a startup that offered lovely office spaces and amenities for freelancers, startups, people who couldn't necessarily afford the rent for their own office. Dr. Romani's guest was Ugo. Oh, I need to check the pronunciation of his last name. Hang on. Okay, I checked the pronunciation. I'm back. Ugo Umbawike, one of WeWork's top community managers. At some point, many people on the inside and the outside of this company saw WeWork as a narcissistic workplace, love bombing with perks and community, future faking with CEO Adam Newman's grand visions of success, 
gaslighting employees and investors when things started to fall apart. You may have heard about the rise and the downfall of WeWork. Well, it wasn't actually a complete downfall. They're still in business and went public in 2021, but only after a colossal crash from its meteoric rise and getting rid of Adam. If you're interested in this, it is an interesting episode. The episode is called Navigating Narcissism in the Workplace at WeWork with Ugo Umbawike. It's interesting to hear about a workplace through a framework of narcissism. This episode got me thinking about how we hear about companies all the time with toxic or narcissistic company cultures, and then reflecting on some of my own experiences. How can a company be narcissistic? Well, one of the things Ugo and Dr. Romani discussed was what draws people to a workplace like this, even though they may be expected to completely sacrifice themselves and work ridiculous hours for limited reward. Same as a narcissistic partner, there's the charisma, the hope, the idea of belonging to something special, trauma bonding, promises of a future payoff, which for a lot of these people didn't come. I mean, it did for some, just because they happened to time things right, but that was kind of like winning a lottery. Even after a disappointing and demoralizing work experience, there is value in being supported by friends and family and other people. It makes you realize, you know, sometimes you think, am I crazy? Is this really happening? Am I overreacting? And a lot of times, if your gut says that you're not crazy and you're not overreacting, you're being gaslit. And I think it's helpful to have people who are supportive when you're going through or when you've gone through something like that. Just like charismatic lovers can do harm, charismatic leaders can do so much harm, not necessarily because they're sadistic, but because they can be so single-minded in their grandiose vision for themselves and the company and maybe their own power and control. Does that sound familiar? It can be tempting to devote yourself to a company to be accepted, to feel uh, wanted, admired. Plus, if you think there's a fabulous future payoff, sometimes it's hard to balance aspirations while protecting ourselves. I've never had a hugely charismatic leader. I mean, I work in IT. How charismatic can any of us be? But I do care very deeply about doing a good job. I care about contributing value to any company I work for. I care about my colleagues. I care about uh, not letting people down. Some of those things are what I missed when I wasn't working. I know I've talked about this before a bit, but it actually turned out that a lot of my self-worth is inextricably tied up with how well I do my job. So when I don't have a job, self-worth plummets. But now that I'm back and reliving the anxiety, I'm kind of hoping that that reminder will help the next time I'm done. But I have to say, I get so annoyed when I hear things like, you're hearing this narrative in the media that people want to be paid too much. People are lazy. Sometimes people like Elon Musk, and he's not the only one. I heard that he was, he was setting up sleep pods at work and getting rid of people who aren't willing to devote their lives to the company. I don't know if that's true. I don't go into it too deeply. I would go into it if I were applying for a job. Not that he'd want me. I'm, I'm not technically brilliant enough for them. That actually reminds me. When I worked shift way back in the 80s in the computer room, this was after Catherine was born, we had a rollout cot, a, a grungy old rollout cot, stored in the vault in case the weather got so bad that it was dangerous to drive home. Whenever there was a heavy snowstorm, one of my colleagues would say quietly to me, it looks like a cot in the vault night. <laughs> I know that kind of sounds dodgy, but it was fine. He wasn't my boss. He was just my friend, and he was only joking. Thankfully, I never had to use that cot. Anyway, don't get me wrong. Some people do seem to be a bit lazy and not care about their work. I've worked with people who sleep at their desks so often. Many colleagues have pictures of him doing it. People who work very hard at finding ways to get other people to do their work 
or find someone to blame if something goes wrong or doesn't get done. I was chatting with one young person recently who lamented that she had to work three days in a row. That's great, I said. You're getting more hours. Honestly, I don't know how she's earning enough money to pay rent in Toronto, even though she's basically in a rooming house, but she's not getting a lot of shifts and hadn't been getting a lot of hours. Her her complaint was that she wasn't getting enough hours. I'm not sure what is the right amount of hours for her. The other thing she said was that her manager is crazy. She's told me in the past how crazy her different managers were. So I'm thinking, okay, well, all the managers can't be crazy. What's going on with this one? She's not happy. She's looking for a better job. But whenever she gets a job interview, she was complaining to me that they ask her to give her examples of problems that she's solved. I don't solve problems, she said. I just do the work. I don't know what to say. Ugh, really? Every job exists because the company has a problem that needs to be solved. They're paying you to show up, be present, be resourceful, and solve problems. If you can do those things, you're going to be valuable. So I said to her, you must have to handle customer complaints. I know she works with the public. Can't you just think of an example ahead of time and describe how you made the customer happy? You know what she said to me? I just get the manager. Well, okay, maybe she's not very resourceful, but surely she does something to solve the problem before she gets the manager involved. I hope. If she's not, maybe that's partly why she's having a hard time getting enough hours to survive or finding another job. That and complaining when she does get more hours. Somewhere in there is a happy medium. You know, I don't think you should have to devote your whole life to a company, but you do need to give enough to make yourself valuable. There's no way that this kind of laziness is the majority. Most people I know work hard and want to do a good job. They care about doing a good job, in spite of the ever-increasing chaos from decades of staff reductions. You, you hear the stories of healthcare workers who are completely burned out. And, you know, we are understaffed in Ontario, and I'm sure in a lot of other places, but they still show up. Most people will step up and work hard and work long hours if they need to do it. I'm willing to put in 60-hour weeks for a while. I've put in close to 100-hour weeks. But for a company to expect that from people long-term on an ongoing basis, it's just not sustainable. How do they take care of their children, their home, their laundry, their food, their health? The assumption is that they're either single with no responsibilities or interests outside of work, Or they have a house spouse who's willing to do all of that work while living with a partner they never see, who's exhausted when they do see them. Or maybe they make enough money to pay someone to do all that work. But you still have to direct the person. Most, you can't just hire someone and expect them to know what to do. They need direction. And thinking about everything takes time and energy. And the other thing is, if you want to be paid more money so that you can pay for help, you're greedy. You're causing inflation. I don't know. I'm all for risk takers earning a profit. I truly am. But I have a hard time reconciling myself to the astronomical earnings when workers are barely surviving financially. Somewhere in there is a reasonable middle ground. And I would be very surprised if guys like Elon Musk were responsible for taking care of their own children or even thinking about the logistics of who's taking care of them. No way does he have to organize their lives, their appointments, what they're going to eat, what they're going to do, who they're going to hang out with, what what they're going to wear. I guarantee you these people who brag about working 60, 80 or more hours a week are not looking after their health or their relationships or responsible for looking after the home. Let's not forget that relationships and health are not separate. You need healthy relationships for physical health. One of the consultants I worked with who had to travel weekly shared some advice she got from another colleague who also had to travel. 
You just need two suitcases, he said. You leave the one at home, then you take the other one when you leave. They're always on rotation. What a genius. Such a time saver. What do you mean, she asked him. You still have to do the laundry and pack every weekend. She was genuinely a bit confused. Oh, no, no, my wife does that while I'm away. Ah, there it is, the mysterious missing piece of the puzzle. I don't understand how anyone could fail to recognize that someone expended a significant amount of time and effort to make the suitcase rotation method work. But even if you don't work for a toxic, narcissistic company, as I don't, like I said, everyone I'm working with is lovely, hardworking, and so nice. But even if that's the case, I bet you're working somewhere where there's chaos. Every lovely person I work with is so busy that they really don't have time for me. I feel like a gnat and annoyance, and that's because I am. I kind of laughingly said that to my manager the other day. I was thanking him for his time because I can never get his ear. I know you've been busy, I said, and I feel as though I'm constantly haranguing people. Well, he said, you're good at it. Thank you? But I'd rather not have to harangue. In this particular role, I suppose it's unavoidable. Because when you're trying to implement changes, particularly the type of changes I'm there to do, it's not people's core job. If you're in sales, you're there to sell. If you work in the warehouse, you're there to manage inventory, do shipping and receiving, and so on. They know what I'm doing has to be done, but security and access controls are difficult for them to fit in with their core job. I'm slowing people down with trying to get into the weeds and understand what they need and how they do everything, making them test everything to make sure it works, hassling them for test evidence, approvals. It's is not a fun job, and yet people are still so nice to me, and I know they're swamped. I don't blame them. But it does seem that every company is in an ever-escalating state of chaos. No one has enough time. We're all too busy. We have other priorities. But this chaos is really a management problem. Not enough people to do the work? That's a management problem. Disorganization? Management problem. People aren't well-trained and don't have time to train, and there's no methodology for training? Management problem. Processes are scattered and inconsistent, and it's not the middle managers necessarily either. This culture comes from the top down. Cut, 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 cut. We don't have time for this. We don't have time for that. Or you get lip service. We're going to do this right. But then nobody has time, so it doesn't end up happening. So if I'm on a project and what I'm doing isn't important enough for your employees to spend their time on it, I really wish you just wouldn't bother hiring me because I don't, I don't want to be the burr under the bonnet. So when things do get done, they're often done haphazardly. I worked on one identity management project for a client, and it did not go well. First of all, they were making all kinds of other changes to other systems, but they had fallen so far behind in my area that we had to hire three part-time people for a couple of months just to catch things up and correct the issues. How had this fallen so far behind? Keeping current had not been a priority. No one had time. They ended up paying for it in the end, though. Then upper management changed, and the new guy decided that keeping current wasn't a priority, so dropped the new processes and laid off most of the staff. Now there really wasn't time to keep up. But even before the identity management system was being designed and implemented, the staff didn't want it. They fought and argued against it. So here am I. I'm brought in. I haven't decided to implement this system. I've just been brought in to facilitate it and to make it happen. But nobody wants it. When their direct manager retired midway or partway through the project, some of them viewed this as an opportunity to renew their fight against the new system. One woman sat with her arms crossed, glowering at me whenever I tried to discuss anything with her. How was I supposed to get past that? I agreed with some of her concerns, though, but the issues were not my doing. I tried to explain to her, look, 
I am being paid to leave. It's my job to advocate and advise on the right thing to do. What makes the most sense? I cannot come into a company and just bulldoze over everything and inflict my own vision. Nor do I want to. I am the decision maker of nothing. I'm here to help you, to enable you so I can leave and you can support the system without me. I think she thought that I would, I don't know what she thought. It would be conjecture on my part. Anyway, she did ease up after a while. And I worked hard to document concepts and processes, and I held training sessions with them on so many areas they weren't necessarily knowledgeable of because they hadn't had time to learn all this stuff. And they were dealing with so much change. They didn't have time to streamline and fix processes necessarily. They seemed to be scrambling to keep on top of the day-to-day onslaught of work. Again, a management problem. Were they the right people for that job? If not, management problem. And the identity management system? The problems I said they would have with it due to the fundamental design decisions of course came to pass, and the system was replaced after I left with something else. Is the something else working any better? Who knows? I'm gone. But just thinking about it now makes me feel the anxiety I didn't even know I was feeling while I was there. And it reminds me of why I never want to be an employee again. At least if you're consulting, you get to leave. They're paying me to leave, and I like it. No matter how the work goes or the projects go, I'm guaranteed that things will change because I'm leaving. Maybe a toxic or chaotic workplace resonates with you. But even if you can't control everything that's happening and you need to earn a living, there may be things you can do to make it a little bit better. It's true that I feel anxiety every day, but as long as I'm working, I make a point of doing things to minimize that anxiety. First, when I'm on, I'm present, and I work hard. No matter what your job is, you're there to solve problems. If I don't know how to solve something, I make sure I figure out how— or I find someone who can help. There is no shame in saying, I don't know, or I don't remember. No one person has all the answers, and you don't have to either. There's no point in faking it. I have known people who do fake it. When I make mistakes, I admit it, fix it, and move on. We all make mistakes, so it's fine. Admitting that you don't know and admitting to mistakes actually builds trust. At least they know they can trust you to be straight with them. I had one manager say, So Julie, why don't you just tell me what you really think for a change? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. The other thing you need to do is cover your butt. I had a manager once who would say things like, If I'm going down, I need to know who I'm taking with me. Whenever our phone conversations ended, I used to email her with a summary of the conversation. Point, point, point ending with something like, please let me know if I've missed or misunderstood anything. These emails have actually saved my butt so many times. She learned to stop complaining because whenever she made something up, which she had a habit of doing, I had the email to show her differently. I did it in a respectful way. I didn't go, ha, I have an email, see? No, no, I would say, I don't know, something like, Oh, I'm sorry, I don't remember that, but I'm sure I emailed you after we talked. Let me check. The thing is, I can always use the excuse that I forget, because I do forget details, which is why I need to keep records. Then I would let her know that I found the email. Thank goodness I documented this. Oh, no, this is what we talked about. Remember now? And she'd be like, oh, yeah. The other thing I recommend is setting boundaries. Technology was supposed to give us more time. I think what it did was it it made us not disconnect from work. And in Ontario, we do have a new law, the right to disconnect. I haven't looked into the details of it because I disconnect anyway, and I'm never anyone's employee. I refuse to connect my phone to work emails because I cannot ignore them. I'm happy to work late. I'll work weekends. I'll be on call. But it has to be arranged and specific. I prefer people to text me if they have an emergency. I'll give them my number. 
That way, I know they had to take an extra step. So it's more likely that I'm just not being flooded with stuff. And my email inbox is always zero. Zero unread emails. I'm a bit compulsive that way, so I have to set that boundary. Otherwise, I'd be looking at them day and night. As a consultant, I think it's very important to document, mentor, and train the staff. The documentation is especially important for me because my work is always audited, but if I expect them to pay me to leave, I need to make myself disposable. Some people work very hard to make themselves indispensable. That's, that's not what I do. Documentation and training enables them to cut me loose so I can move on to the next thing. That reminds me, Abe had a horrific client once, really toxic. Well, he was contracted through a company who had the client. The client wasn't horrific. It was this middleman who was. And the guy running the show, the middleman, didn't want the consultants emailing or talking to the client without him. It was like this guy, you're not allowed to talk to the client. I have to read all your emails first. Can you imagine how much that would slow things down? It's ridiculous. When Abe let the client know he was going to be out of the office for a week, the guy lost it. You don't tell the client you're out of the office. I'm the project manager. It's up to me to communicate with the client. <sighs> we think the guy might have been billing the client for time the consultants weren't even working because one of the other guys was told not to let on when he was on a training course. So yeah, actually, Abe knows for a fact that they billed even if the consultant wasn't working. And the guy got mad when Abe tried to provide knowledge transfer and documentation to the client. It's not in the scope. Whatever. You could argue that that was out of scope, but there's no way any project should have zero knowledge transfer and documentation in scope. That's ridiculous. It's not like he was spending weeks and days and hours. I just think this guy seemed to have no interest in enabling the client so the consultants could leave. He was trying to establish a long-term gravy train, which I think is tantamount to stealing. The other thing is they had a technical architecture planned that would have performed suboptimally and cost thousands more than the solution Abe recommended. But the guy refused to allow Abe to present his solution because they didn't want to seem wishy-washy. Red flag, red flag, and there were more. It was a ridiculously toxic environment. Poor Abe was so, so stressed having to deal with that guy. He, total asshole. Finally, one of the guy's enablers said to the consultants, and I think at first Abe didn't realize the other guy was an enabler of the main guy, but turned out they were in on the scam together. But he said to the consultants, you either do things our way or you're out. Abe came home and decided he was out. As he was writing his letter of resignation, he received a text from the guy letting him know that his contract was canceled, effective immediately. <sighs> what a relief. That meant Abe didn't have to resign, because one of the things we were worried about was the four-week cancellation clause, because either party was supposed to give four weeks' notice. And I'm like, oh, we don't even want four weeks' notice. Thank you very much for canceling. But after Abe left... They, the company found out that their architecture wasn't even technically feasible, and they ended up using Abe's proposal. Ha <laughs> ha. And the client used to sometimes contact Abe, asking if he was available for advice. But I mean, there were rules that you couldn't go to the client of them. And as long as that guy was there, there's no way, <laughs> there's no way Abe would have gone back. Ridiculous. I told Abe I was going to talk about this, and he Googled the guy, and he's still in business. Beware, we are truly mystified as to how this guy is still in business, but it just goes to show you that some diabolical people seem to succeed in spite of themselves. This guy was truly diabolical. The moral of that little anecdote is always, always act in the client's best interest. Your integrity is everything. Plus, legally, you have to work in the client's best interest. 
That situation was so much worse than anything I've ever experienced. I can't even imagine what I would have done, how I would have handled that. Luckily, Abe could afford to walk away. If he couldn't afford to leave, he would have had to find something new before he called it quits. He and I are very lucky because both of us are earning. But if you're the only one bringing in the money, you don't necessarily have the luxury of walking away without something to go to. So, yeah, companies are in chaos, and some of them are toxic and even narcissistic. But one thing you can count on is change. Leaders will change. Some of your coworkers will change. You'll change. If your situation is really terrible, I think the best thing to do is for you to be the one making the change rather than waiting for something else to happen. People talk about work-life balance, but I know that that can be easier said than done. And if you can't walk away financially, you may have to suffer through a bad situation until you find something else. But please do make the effort to find something else for your own sanity and well-being. You deserve to work for someone who appreciates you. Trust your gut. Your gut knows the truth when it comes to partners, friends, and work. It's worth it. We, we spend so much time earning a living, but I've never heard of anyone on their deathbed say, oh, I wish I'd worked more. Thank you for listening. If you have anything you'd like to share or ask, email me at jewelsays at gmail.com. And I'll include info about the Navigating Narcissism podcast. Really is fascinating. 